All right, I just wanted, I love this picture. This is probably one of my favorite pictures that I've ever taken. Just shows you what goats are. Cigar goat. So this was in Arkansas. This was my, one of my out yards. I just had eight hives on two pallets and it was in a goat farm. Mm -hmm. Well, it was mostly a chicken and turkey farm, but they had goats there also. So it was nice because it was, um, it was a fully fenced area that had guard dogs. So there were no bears or skunk problems. So that was really convenient. And I put extra bricks on top of the hives so that the, in case the goats clammed up there, they wouldn't hurt anything. Where am I? That's not what I want. This is what I want. Okay, swarm trapping. Swarm trapping is one of the things that I have been convinced that is one of the most important parts of backyard beekeeping because I've been talking, part of my problem is when I get up here to give a talk, like I'm so excited about what I'm telling you that I already told you a bunch of it already in the previous talk. So forgive me if I repeat some things. Um, swarm trapping to me is really important. It's a way to increase your number of hives for basically free, uh, bring in local um, well acclimatized genetics into your collection, um, teach you how, teach you more about bee biology and about swarms. It's just all around, I don't, I don't really see a downside to catching swarms at all. And like I said before, only about 25% of swarms are successful in finding a new home and surviving the first winter. And so by catching swarms and incorporating them into your operation, are actually helping the bees more than normally they would be. Um, so one of the important things that I want people to understand about swarms is that they're healthy bees and they're treatment-free bees. Whatever, whatever the treatment they had the previous year, they've left in the previous hive. So you have none of the problems with contaminated comb or disease, even even American fowl brood tends to all get left back in the original hive. So what you're getting is just the pure bees. They're bees that are ready to build. They are programmed to build. They do the best job at building. Um, and even bees, swarms that, even small swarms, if you feed a small swarm, they will explode. Um, that's what I, those, the small swarms tend to be the ones that I give away to other people. So I'll feed them a little bit so they get bigger and then I give them to somebody else. Um, the big, the really big ones that do really well immediately without being fed, those are the ones I want to keep for myself. Now there's, I don't know how much you guys have been taught about this. But when I was young and first starting to read beekeeping magazines, they were always insisting that if you caught a swarm, that you requeen it immediately because you don't know where these dirty forest bees came from. <laughs> um, and I never, never understood that because like the, the forest bees are the ones that are, that are doing great on their own. They've survived the winter, they're healthy. Um, now I heard over here, was it you talking about catching a swarm in August and that's not a swarm if you get if you get it in August? They call them August, they say it's a swarm and it's usually not. Yeah. It's usually wasps or something. Well if it is honeybees, a swarm in August is generally an absconded hive, not a swarm. And those are probably not going to make it either. So you're looking for the, the best swarms are the prime swarms right at the beginning of swarm season. They're the biggest swarms, they're the healthiest. Uh, they build up the quickest. If you get a swarm in like August or sometime, then likely what you have is a hive that was so overrun with mites that they just gave up and left. So that's not necessarily uh, a desirable thing to have. 
Um, Were you mentioned feeding swarms? Hmm? Were you mentioned feeding swarms? Mm -hmm. Do you do like a sugar water mix or frames full of honey? Uh, feeding is just sugar water mix. Okay. I don't do that a whole lot. It's, I had a I had a swarm last year that it came in. It was only it only filled up like a frame and a half. It's a very tiny swarm, and so. I just fed them and they decided that they were healthy and um, I gave them to I gave them to the guy who on whose property I keep my bees and they're still alive so great they're a year old now so I talked a whole lot about cost swarms being cheap um, and about how cost People want to protect their investment, and that leads to treating sometimes. A lot of times it does. People afraid that their bees will die. If you're afraid of anything, maybe beekeeping's not for you. Because um, being afraid, being afraid that things are going to die, being afraid of bees, being afraid of getting stung, being afraid in general is not going to put you in, I mean, just chemically, psychologically speaking, being afraid is not good for you. It's, it's, it puts you in a mindset to survive and, and everything else be damned. It's just, it's not the right mindset to be in. So if you're going to be afraid, don't do it. And um, again, that's why I don't buy bees, because you're afraid you lose your money. If you got loads of money, and you're afraid you're going to lose it, just give it away. It's not worth it. <laughs> the other thing that's really fun about beekeeping is that it's like fishing. Anybody like fishing? One for two fishermen? All right, awesome. Um, if you don't like fishing, swarm catching is a lot like fishing, only you don't have to get wet. There's no boats, no hooks. Um, but it's like... One of the reasons I like to, to liken it to fishing is because if you think about fishing, how do you successfully catch a fish, right? You have a bunch of ingredients that you need to get a fish on the line. First of all, you're going to need a line. You're probably going to need a hook, maybe a net. Uh, you're going to need a fishing hole that has fish in it. That always helps. Um, what else you need? You need if you're fly fishing, you need to be able to actually do the fly fishing thing. I've never done it. I should try that sometime. Uh, you need really good bait, and the better combination you have between all of those things, the better your chances are of catching a fish. Well, the same thing works with swarms. There's a bunch of different variables that we're going to look at that that are the most attractive when a, when a colony is looking for a new cavity. Because, because as we all know, a swarm is a, is a colony reproducing itself. Right? So they're, they're looking for certain things. We can think in, in a human perspective. They're not human. And um, you'll never hear me referring to bees as girls because they're not. They're bees. And you won't hear me referring to people like I refer to bees. They're completely, in my mind, they're completely separate. But because we're humans, we think of things in human ways, and so it's good to make good comparisons between the two. Not to get, not to get too tied to it. When I, when I hear people refer to bees as girls, which un, undoubtedly three-fourths of you do, um, I think that perhaps I don't want to insult you. Um, perhaps you're bringing emotion into it too much. Your preference, you can do whatever you want. But that's why I don't. Because I want to, I want to keep separate from the situation. I want to be objective in what I'm doing rather than be driven by emotion. So what a hive is doing, what a colony is doing when it's looking for a new hive is it's looking for a cavity with a specific set of characteristics. Those characteristics are going to be adding up in the long run 
to allow them to survive the best. Whichever the best hole is, that's the one we want to move into. That gives us the best chance of surviving the coming winter and then reproducing again the next year. And you can read um, Honeybee Democracy, which, has, which is all about swarming and has a lot of these sorts of aspects to it. So one of the primary ones is the volume of the box. So, um, depending on whose study you read, the preferred volume for a box for a new swarm is somewhere between 35 and 60 liters for a standard European honeybee swarm. Africanized bees will be, will be much smaller cavity, so we're not going to worry about them here. So do your unit conversions, so that would be about 9 to 15 gallons or one and a half to two cubic feet. Okay, so what kind of boxes should we be looking at? Here we have a 10 frame deep. 10 frame deep has a volume of about 43 liters, so that's right in the range that we're looking for. But a 10 frame deep is a little heavy. You might go for an eight frame deep, which has a volume of 35 liters. So it's right at the bottom of, of our optimal zone. So that's, conversion that's about a one and a quarter cubic feet or uh, nine and a half gallons. So conversely, a medium or a five frame nuke is a little small for what we're doing. Five frame nuke is 23 liters, but if you want to double it up uh, to make a vertical one that'll hang closer to the tree, that'll be back up at 46 liters and will be I've, I've started to see a lot of people making, people who make swarm traps, uh, a lot of people are using uh, a box that's the size of a double five frame, so five over five, and they leave the bottom empty. So they just have five in the top. And so as long as you get to the hive before they build, before they finish building up that top five frames and start building free comb on the bottom, um, you have the optimum size box, you only have to put five frames in it, and as long as you get them before they start building new comb, you don't have to worry about cleaning up the mess. Now if you're like me and you're a total procrastinator, you're going to be cleaning up the mess every time. Another option would be an eight frame medium. I'm trying, uh, that's 24 liters, so that's a bit small, but you could double it up and make 48 liters for a double and eight frame medium. I'm trying a couple this year. Uh, I'm trying some 10 frame mediums, which doubled up would be 58 liters. So that's right at the upper level of what we're looking for. And at that size, they're getting pretty heavy. I mean, two, two 10 frame mediums is pretty big. I'm also trying a, a single 10 frame medium, which is what, 29 liters? So it's a little small, but we'll see what happens. Maybe it'll work, maybe I'll catch a small swarm, or maybe I'll catch a big swarm, that'd be nice. Now if you're doing something like, uh, say here's one of my double 10 frame mediums from last year. And here are my logs, which, I, which are drying in my garage. I, I bought these from, my, uh, from a local firewood seller, producer, processor. And he didn't, he, they don't like the hollow logs because they're rotted inside. You don't want, if you're, if you're selling nice split firewood, you don't want like one side to be rotted, I guess. So he was just piling them up in a pile and burning them. And I said, hey, I'll take those. And he said, what did he say? I said, I asked him how much I owed him and he said, how much would 20 bucks worth of honey be? And I said, uh, so I, normally that would be one quart, but I gave him two quarts because it's some good logs. So uh, this year, I don't know if I'll have enough time this year. At some point, I need to get them out. <laughs> the procrastination is strong with this one. Um, but I, yeah, these are, these are part of my future projects to start some, some log hives. 
So if you're trying to catch swarms in a log hive, your volume is going to be hit or miss. But like I said, these are all factors for catching a swarm. There's not a single one that is everything, right? They're, they're, you can add them up. And in, uh, in Honeybee Democracy, by, he did some, Tom Seeley did some experiments by controlling the um, cavities that were available. He did some tests to see if the bees would accept a less optimal hive, and they would if they didn't have anything else. Are you planning to use these to catch swarms or to just have colonies move in and really do? Uh, eventually, I'll try to catch swarms in them. Um, if I can't catch swarms in them, I'll probably, I don't know, do maybe like a shaken swarm into them just to get them started. And then they'll be, for the most part, unmanaged colonies just decorative and, and producing swarms and whatnot. Yeah. When I get them done. So another really important factor is using a used box. A used box has, uh, firstly, it's not fresh wood. Fresh wood has a very strong scent to it and bees don't necessarily like that over, over strong scent. And so um, if, you're, if you're buying new boxes and trying to catch swarms with them, you're probably not going to have a lot of luck because that scent from, from the, you know, the pitch and the, the resin in the wood, it's going to be a little strong for the bees. So you yeah, an older box would be good, um, and especially a used box that has had bees in it before because it's going to have all those pheromones and things in there that bees are attracted to. Once they know that there's a colony that has lived in there before, they're much more likely to move in there again. Yeah? I did build new ones last year. Mm -hmm. And to get rid of a little bit of this new wood smell, um, I painted the inside with a propolis wash. Painted the inside with a propolis wash? Mm -hmm. How did you make that? Propolis and alcohol. Propolis and alcohol. And then the alcohol just sort of, and it wasn't very strong, but it seemed to do the trick. And then I put uh, one frame of old Well, it worked for you, so... <laughs> That's hard to beat. <laughs> six out of six is hard to beat. Another part is used comb. So this was a dead out that I had. Obviously, a cluster that was too small to survive the winter. This was, I don't know, five years ago or something. But they left me these nice, straight combs, a uh, nice dark comb that I could, and so I put in, in my hives, in my, in my swarm traps, I'll put one dark comb in there, and then I'll fill the rest with foundation, foundation, comb, uh, frames with foundation. Uh, the reason why I use foundation is because I don't ha want to have to worry about the hive being perfectly level. Um, Jason Bruns, who I've had on my podcast a couple of times about catching swarms, he uses all foundationless, and so his method, he, um, when he hangs the, the trap in the tree, he keeps the trap all perfectly level so that when the bees build comb in there, it fits in the, fits in the frames and works well. So that's a, that if, if, you're, if you want to keep in foundationless, definitely tr check out his methods. His website is letembee.com, L-E-T-M-B-E-E, -E -E, let him be. And he's an excellent resource for um, swarm trapping, and in fact, a lot of my information I've gotten from him, so I'm not shy about pointing everybody in his direction. And if you don't have whole frames, um, a small piece will work as well. It's a little chunk that you rubber band into a frame or stick in a corner or something. Um, smear it around in there, smear some propolis in there, whatever you can get if you're, if you're starting out, whatever you can get from your friends. Uh, anything's better than nothing, so don't be discouraged. Repeat location. This is, this is kind of counterintuitive because um, it is a fact that swarms will often return to the same location year after year after year after year. Nobody knows why, but they do. Even if you cut down the tree 
or whatever, they'll still end up in the same spots and nobody knows why. So if you find a spot that catch that you've caught a swarm before, put a trap there again. Or if you've, if you've retrieved a swarm from a spot, try and get a trap in that area so that you can catch that swarm the next year. That's one of the curious ones, it's just nobody knows why they do that, but they very definitely do. This is um, somebody that I know uh, near Medford. I set a trap up on top of her, what is that called, an arbor, and catch bees. It's a good spot. I think they've got, hmm? they've got ways of communicating through the generations. Hmm. That may be so. Next one is entrance size. Now if you think about entrance size, it kind of makes sense because you want, if you're a bee, you want a, an entrance in your colony that is big enough for bees to come and go, big enough to ventilate the hive well, but also small enough to not be overventilated and small enough to be easily defendable. So the recommended size for an entrance is about two square inches. Now that can be like this is an inch and a half or maybe it's an inch and a quarter. Whatever it is. A uh, round hole with a disc entrance. A lot of you have seen the disc entrances before. Or it could be a slot. Or uh, you also saw one of my this one really there's just there are no entrances it's just rotted out corners of the box so that's what I do with my old boxes so for if you're trying to drill a hole that's exactly two square inches you just use an inch and a half um, hole saw that gets you just about right there. Pheromone lure. Uh, so you can buy pheromone lures pre-made, which are probably better than lemongrass oil. Um, and you can buy like Swarm Commander or Man Lake sells their own version. Um, pretty much every beekeeping supply place has their own version uh, in Swarm Commander. Or if you want to go a much cheaper route would be using lemongrass oil. So what I do is I take one of those shorter type sheets of paper towel, I fold it in half and I stick it in a sandwich bag and I drip say 10 drops of lemongrass oil in there and then close the bag. Now the oil will slowly permeate through the plastic so you don't have to worry about it. It, it doesn't evaporate too fast and doesn't overpower the bees because if there are bees even if it's a smell they like if there's too much they won't like it so you don't want it to go too fast and if it evaporates too fast then it's gone so that's why I like to use this way and in fact um, the pheromone lures that you find for sale are actually these little plastic capsules that slowly leak not leak but the the oil permeates through the plastic and is slowly released so that really helps and um, a lot of times the bees will chew up the plastic or propolize it all, stick it to everything. Doesn't matter. I mean, it's just a it's just a sandwich bag. It costs a few cents. And lemongrass oil is fairly cheap. I think I bought this year. I think I bought a pint for like twenty dollars. And a pint will last me for years. And if you have a pint, you can share it with someone else. Like even, even this little, was that a one ounce bottle? I think that lasted me three years, two years, something like that. So there's plenty. Another factor is the height of the box. So bees like, like a, remember, Honeybee Democracy said that the average height of the bees in was it New York was like 22 feet off the ground. So they do like to be off the ground. However, I have also caught some swarms with a hive sitting on the ground, as Jason does also. Um, and last year, a major portion of the swarms that I caught were boxes just sitting on my back deck, which is about 
Uh, at the edge, it's about eight feet off the ground. Uh, so this is recommended eight to 15 feet. So um, you might cinch the hive up into a tree, or I like to do it this way. I just have my six foot ladder there. Now this, this is kind of a forced perspective, so it doesn't look exactly right. I'm actually looking down a hill at the tree, which is at the bottom of the hill. And the ladder is kind of at a further angle than you might expect, so I was able to to stand up and put it up there. But just remember, whatever, wherever you put the hive up, you're gonna have to get it back down and it may have bees in it at the time. So keep that in mind. I, I have fallen off of things like ladders. It's not, don't do it, you wouldn't like it. Um, I was putting, my, my mom got me a weather station for my birthday two years ago. And I was putting it, I was trying to get it up on top of the house and I fell off a ladder and landed in a pile of bicycles. So, and I broke the weather station. <laughs> I, was, I was really bummed about that. One of the things that's, this real, that I find really useful about swarm traps is I make them, as you've seen, I make them out of my old boxes. That's a, where was I? So, this is, these white ones are some old 10 frame nukes that I made that I now use as swarm traps. Um, these are just my old 10 frame boxes that I bought back in, my first batch of boxes that I bought back in 2003 when I first started. A lot of them are still perfectly good, but there's starting to be a, a greater proportion of them that now have rotted corners or rotted edges and stuff, so they become swarm traps. Now, oh, there's one thing you can notice here. If you pay close attention, he actually screws a one by or a two by two in the corners of the boxes. So if you've got a box that's like really rickety and falling apart, you can keep it together that way. And uh, chances are you'll, you'll, unless you're me, you'll, uh, you'll retrieve the box before the bees build comb in that empty space. And that empty space is actually good. You want some empty space in there. The bees like, they seem to like to have some empty space to move around in. Tom Seeley talks about how the bee will, will crawl all around the inside and take little short flights to estimate the, the volume of the cavity. Um, for me, I don't think foundation gets in the way of that, but it might. It might be that my foundation is, is losing me some swarms. I don't know. Be good to do an experiment. But I think even with still, you know, foundations an inch and an inch and three eighths part, so there's there's empty space in there. That'd be a good good experiment. You also don't want too much light, so you can see Jason's swarm box here has several vent holes drilled in it. So he's much better swarm catcher than I am, so apparently that's not too much light. But what you don't want to do is use something like a white five gallon bucket because the, the white plastic is too translucent. You let in too much light and the bees won't like that. They won't, they won't start a hive in there. You also want to make sure that you have some afternoon shade. I've discovered that colonies will move into a box and then if it's sitting in the sun in the afternoon, they'll move right back out again. They don't like it. And that makes sense because you don't want, uh, if you're a bee, you don't want a cavity that you have to expend a whole bunch of energy cooling all the time. That's not good, that's not good for the operation, right? Does it matter if you paint it or not? I, mean... I don't think it matters if you paint it. The, uh, you can see the bottom of my box is here. Yeah, the yeah, bottom's not painted. Um, which actually, that caused me some problems this last year because I had, was giving, giving that swarm to that guy. And um, so I had closed the entrance, and picked up the box to take it to his car, and there was a hole in the bottom. And so there was bees out everywhere. And I told him, told him, go wait in the car. 
I gotta fix this. So I got my bee suit on and stapled some screen over it and then took it out to him. So it all worked out. Now you, you want a really good way to attach the box to a tree. Now you can, without attaching it, you can put it on a, like a shaded spot up on a roof or something. Um, or in buildings around here, a lot of buildings have flat roofs. If you have a shaded area in the afternoon, you can put it up on, up on the roof and that'll work. Um, so what you can see here are a couple of ways. You can see Jason's method, kind of. He uses a, like a, a kid's swing chain. A little piece of chain that you can get at Lowe's or Home Depot or anywhere, hardware store. And what he does is takes a piece of chain and he gets one of those little clips. And so he sets it up into the tree. He wraps the chain around and clips it. So it's at first it's just hanging there. I think it's an S hook. S hook, that's right. And then he, you can see some shims. So he shims it up so that it's level, sitting level forward to back, side to side doesn't matter. Uh, so the shims are, shims are making it level. And then when that's all done, he puts a ratchet strap on it to hold it to the tree. And that keeps the tree, like there's no screws or anything involved in the tree. Don't use nails, nails will come out. Um, I use screws. So the, the one that I do, this is one of the two ways that I do it. So this is two, one by twos, and there's a three inch screw in the bottom and the top of each of them. So that works on bigger trees. I also use, this one is a single one by four with two screws in the top and two screws in the bottom. And generally I just put it up at the top of the ladder, maybe lift it up a couple inches so I can get the screw gun in there and screw it into the tree. Doesn't really hurt the tree that much. You know, trees can heal, so I'm not too worried about it. And if you're trying to prevent logging companies from cutting down trees, that's also one way to do it. I've heard people do that. I've never done it myself. No. <laughs> so does anybody have any idea what might have done this? Squirrel, that's right. Somebody throw some candy to that person. <laughs> uh, these are Jason's boxes. I had um, one of my, you saw the pictures of my five frame plywood nukes. In Arkansas, I could catch all sorts of swarms with my five frame nukes. The swarms out there just tended to be smaller. Um, in Oregon, I have never been able to catch a single swarm in a five frame nuke for whatever reason. I, I'm guessing they just need a bigger cavity. So that's what they're after. But um, for some reason, one year, some squirrels found one of my five frame nukes and just chewed, chewed it up. And so what I ended up doing is I, I screwed a handhold into it and I put my smoker fuel and my hive tools and my smoker and everything in that box and now I carry it around for my smoker box. But, um, Definitely do keep your prepared swarm traps outside because you will catch swarms in those traps sitting in your backyard. Uh, these are Jason's, but yes, I have mine sit out on my back deck and I, I catch swarms in them. And I also have other boxes of, of comb and stuff sitting out there as well. So there's plenty of smell flying around the neighborhood so all the bees are hopefully attracted to my place but yeah once you've prepared your swarm traps leave them outside um, and you'll catch swarms that way um, hmm is there any need to separate swarm traps the question is is there any need is to there separate minimum, swarm traps is there a minimum separation distance I don't think there's an official separation distance. Um, like I said, you'll catch swarms in piles of boxes like this. But uh, Jason recommends and I recommend separating them by some. Um, you want 
you want a prospective colony to be able to differentiate between two new locations, right? Because they go through a democratic process of deciding which cavity to move into. And if, you know, if, if you got like this and you have all identical cavities, uh, you might have issues. There's been recorded with, with swarms not being able to decide which cavity to go to. And um, either not, either just staying on the branch and, and dying there, or another one that, that he mentions in the book is a swarm that flew off and separated into two and going back and forth and they eventually lost the queen and the whole operation failed. So we do recommend separating them, but like, you know, like I said, at, at my house, I've got, I've got four sitting in the back, four sitting on the back porch and two sitting on the front step. So we'll see what happens. So like I said, it's, it's not a, there's not a single thing that's a, it's a single deciding factor. Um, I mean, if you have a, even, even with box size, you'll still get, once in a while you'll get a swarm in a very small box. It's very rare. Sometimes you'll get swarms in open rooms and in, in abandoned buildings. In fact, there's a, let me show you a picture that I have. I just uh, took the time to put all of my beekeeping pictures in one folder, so now that I have them, I can show them to people. And it's a big folder. And it's a big folder. Where did it go? Okay, here it is. Uh, so this, this lady that I interviewed for my podcast, I went out to her farm, and she, this barn kept collecting these multiple open air colonies in the barn. And so you can see all of the comb there that was from a previous colony that died out. And I don't recall if she was trying to catch a swarm here or what. But the, the one colony that did survive, and this box is about the volume of three or maybe four deeps. And so this huge open air colony that she just put up plywood around and enclosed it so that it wouldn't be uh, a, a danger to her horses and stuff. But yeah, that was, that was really fun to see. Is there anything else I want to show you here? Here's another corner of a swarm trap. Which hive is this? Oh, this is the one at this is the one at my dad's house. So this is one of my repeat areas too. This has been this was the third swarm that I caught right there. So that was really good. All right, does anybody have any questions? Yes. How far away do your swarm traps take you from your real hives or your your normal hives? They don't have to be far away from your normal hives at all unless you want to catch swarms from your own hives. If you want to catch swarms from your own hives you want your swarm trap to be at least a couple hundred yards away. But anywhere there's a swarm trap you can catch catch swarms from the area. But they tend to want to be if you want to catch your own swarms, they tend to want to leave their home location and go to somewhere else to start a new colony. Oh, thank you for coming. Okay. I'll be hanging around for a little bit if anybody wants to ask me any more questions or anything. I will not leave you with questions. <laughs>